Hi there everyone, welcome back to another video here with me Jenny Kirk and today I've got a review for you and this is of a model which Hattons has currently got on sale in their bargain section and they're very kind to offer to send over a copy on a loan to review so I've got that here and I'm going to take a closer look so this model is provided by Hattons Model Railways but it's not a freebie because they want it back afterwards. Let's take a closer look. Well, this is the model. It's the Daypole Class 121 stroke 122 diesel rail car. Now, Daypole do both subtle variants of this model and they do it in quite a few different liveries. And uh, if you head on over following the link in the description below, you'll be able to see the full list of those that Hatton's Model Railways has got on offer. And uh, if any of those take your fancy, then uh, uh, you can buy them there. But um, the one that they've sent over for me to review is, um, this is the Class 122 bubble car in uh, BR Root Learning Blue. And they thought that this was one which uh, suited my BR late 70s, early 80s period of modelling. But as I said before, they're available in Network Southeast, Regional Railways, various different BR Blue liveries, but also right through into the privatisation period with rail track liveries, uh, Network Rail liveries, I believe, and uh, also where uh, they're available as Chilton Railways. There's quite a lot on there, so you really are spoilt for choice uh, depending on any of the periods that you wish to model. Now, the Class 122 and the 121, they're actually really long-lasting first-generation DMUs, built in 1958, and uh, they were built by the Gloucester uh, Railway Carriage and Wagon Works. Uh, there's 20 of these made, double-ended driving motor vehicles, nicknamed bubble cars, um, and they were also supplemented by nine single-ended trailer vehicles, and uh, it's interesting, actually, I didn't realise that they were made with um, the availability of having these driver trailers to go with them to make them up into two car units. But um, in terms of uh, as a model, they're actually really, really useful because if you're space starved, uh, class 121 or a 122, being only a single car unit really does mean that you can um, you know, fit them into pretty much any model railway. And later on in life, they were used by BR and then later rail track and network rail as route learning vehicles after they passed out of the revenue earning fleet, which meant that you could justify seeing these on freight only branch lines and all sorts. So I'm just having a look here. On the end of the box there, you can see um, it comes with, it's a 21 pin chassis, uh, DCC ready. There are options available on the site which are pre-fitted with the DCC chip, but I've actually got myself uh, an appropriate 21 pin chip here, and I'm gonna have a go at fitting it myself later on. And we're gonna film that just to help you out and uh, give you an idea of what it's involved to get a chip into one of these. Uh, but I've fitted some of the Daypole models in the past and they've um, in most instances actually been quite easy. Now radius 2 it says there is the minimum radius for this but um, in experience I found that you can sometimes tease these to go around anything a bit tighter if you really really need to but generally speaking you should try and stick to that as a guide. The boxes for the Daypole locomotives are really quite substantial. It's quite a firm cardboard outer, plenty of foam. And then there's actually a lot of paperwork in here. I was hoping that there might have been... Um, actually, yes, there is. Um, there's a little brief history in here as well. And uh, it gives you some details about what uh, the model has. And what was quite interesting to me is that it has five different lighting functions. And I've never really looked into lighting functions before, but I'm quite interested to see just what that actually involves. And I'm guessing that with a 21 pin chip, hopefully that should be able to support five lighting functions. So I, I'm, I'm as interested as you are to find out just what that actually means. Now, on the back as well, and this is well, something I've complained about in the past with not really models from Daypole, but 
across the board. And it's nice to see that manufacturers are starting to provide these little diagrams of where the extra detail packs, um, how to fit them. And actually being a single car unit, which generally speaking would have traveled about on its own, I can actually see um, a very viable use for, for putting all this on even both ends of it. And I actually, I'm tempted for the first time ever to actually fit my model with all of the detail on the grounds that I'm just going to be using it as a, a standalone unit and not really going to be having it with a tail load. But of course, I can't do that unless I buy it. So uh, I'm getting a bit ahead of myself there. Um, but um, certainly, uh, yeah, that, I mean, it's tempting actually. Let's just see how good this model is actually. It, it, I must admit, it's one that's been on my radar for quite some time. So let's see what else have we got here. Um, Let's have a look. Um, ah, there is, interestingly enough, there's some switches internally, so you can, presumably this is more helpful for DC running, you can turn lights on and off, and it gives you some more information on uh, the actual different DCC functions. So I'm looking through there. So you've got F1, F0, F3 mentioned. Um, I'm, it's something I'm going to play about with up in the loft. I am as interested as you are on all of this, but it's really handy that Daypool provide all of this information in the box. So you're not going to find yourself hunting through Google and desperately uh, trying to figure out what's going on. And they're just, it's a warranty card is what the last one is. So I'm going to lift this out of the box and just put that all to one side. And it's pretty standard fitting now. All the manufacturers use these, and it's, it's actually a pretty good way of holding the models. Um, there's the detail pack that uh, I was talking to you about. So we've got enough bits of pipe work, like vacuum pipes, couplings, that kind of things, um, to uh, supplement both ends of the uh, of the the actual model. It comes. I'm looking at it. It is fitted with slimline tension lock couplings. Uh, but they'll be in an end pocket and be able to be removed if you want to fit this in. Let's get this all out from here. And there's actually a good weight to that when I'm lifting it out. And what I'm feeling is that there's there's a pretty good weight to it. It's not quite as heavy as the Helgen Class 128, but it's certainly up there. And, you know, with, with this, we've got a full interior that you can see in there. So I'm actually looking there. Is it... It looks to be bench seats all the way across, is there? Oh no, there is a walkway down the middle, so um, it's not like pre-grooving coaches where once you're in a compartment, you were stuck there for the journey, whether you liked it or not. You could actually walk up and down these. I'm not sure whether they included a, a lavatory or not. Uh, possibly, um, I think actually possibly at the front end here, there may be a lavatory, but I'm not sure why, why that immediately thinks to mind. I guess it's just because <laughs> Whenever whenever I travel, I always need to know where the loos are. And one thing that really strikes me just looking at this out of the box is all of this underframe detail picked out in a variety of different colours as per the prototype. That is actually really, really nice. Um, you know, it, whilst I said this, this model was on my radar from when it was launched, and it's always been a case for me that whenever I've looked at buying one myself, there's always been another model comes up where I think, oh, actually, I, I, I want that a little bit more. So it's always been pushed down the priority list. But being able to take a good close look at this, thanks to Hatton sending over this uh, this loaner to review, it's actually really bringing home to me that actually you know, maybe I've been overlooking a really good model. Um, this underframe detail is actually quite exquisite. That is actually really nicely done. It's difficult to tell how much of that is separately applied detail and how much is tampo printed relief on, on one plastic molding. But the fact that I can't tell bodes really well for it, and that is really nice. Um, I'm also seeing as well, because these were um, diesel mechanical, you can actually see the um, representation of the prop shaft going to the bogies with the universal joint, and there's the same on both ends. Now, that doesn't actually connect with the bogey because it, it's purely for show, and also uh, the travel on these bogies is far, far greater than the prototypes would ever have needed to have travelled around. But it, what it does mean is that at a casual glance from the side, you can see that representation of the prop shafts. 
Now I'm going to turn it over and again, yeah, we've got the same detail on the other side as well. And that is just really, really nice. Even down to the way that they finished, I'm looking there, it looks like an etched metal grill, but it's not. It's the way it's been very, very carefully tampo printed over the plastic relief. We've actually got this sort of radiator effect and that is really well done. And all of this is really crisply applied. I don't really see, to my eye, any fuzziness. Uh, everything's there. That is actually really nice. Even some of this orange, orange markings. That attention to detail is actually really, really good. And um, even though I'm handling it, it seems reasonably robust. I'm always very frightened how much pressure you put on stuff like this uh, below sole bar pipework in case it just showers off. And I know that uh, we've had a little bit of an issue with some manufacturers in the past of having models that just self-destruct and grenade all of this detail into the box. But looking in the box, there's absolutely nothing that has fallen off this in transit. So, um, and it, you know, it hadn't sent the review sample out through the post. So it has already been subjected to uh, the parcel delivery company. And of course it's come from China originally as well. So actually it stood up to that really, really well, which is a testament both to the quality of the packaging and also the quality of the workmanship of, of, of the model and the fit of the pieces. We've also got, um, just looking there very closely, it is plastic molded detail, but it's one of those things that I've, I keep saying about this. There's no point in having separately fitted detail if it doesn't add anything to the model other than cost. And the way that this has been tampo printed, those door handles and the little uh, rails there, that the hand hand holds, are actually really well done. And until you get really, really close, it's not possible to 100% to discern whether it is separately applied or moulded on. But I'm telling you now, it's moulded on, but it's just really, really well done. The driver's handrails on the ends, those are separately applied plastic detail. And... Um, it's plastic rather than metal, so one thing I would say is that just be a little bit careful how you handle these at either end, because they may be prone to breaking. I'm not going to put them to the test, because Hattons wants this back, uh, and they did say to me, try and keep it in uh, resellable uh, condition. In terms of the application of the yellow, um, I... And it's very difficult to tell, actually. I'm just looking at where the demarcation is. It's right on the, the edge of the door there, and I'm seeing ever so minute bleed over of the yellow, but it's not unduly noticeable. And I'm looking to the other end. The other end does seem sharper, but and there is, again, a little bit of fuzziness just at the top of the cantrail. Uh, but in terms of everything else, the BR double arrow is nicely done. The number is on there and uh, looks just fine. The guards compartment, I can read guard perfectly well. I can read private on the uh, cab compartment doors. So um, we've also got some kind of tampo printing on the door drop lights. Now I, I'm struggling here actually. I'm just gonna see, can I read it? I think it says, please close the door. It'd be interesting to see um, just how well that shows up under magnification. I'm really struggling with my eyes, but I think it says, please close the door. Oh, and also I've just noticed that this uh, unit actually has a name, it's Thunderbird One. I really like that actually. And uh, this this model is actually reaching out to me more and more. It's um it's um it's got so many little touches that I really, really like. Now let's look at the front face of this model. We've got uh white rimmed sprung loaded metal buffers, which um they they feel yeah, they're they're actually pretty Pretty well in there. Again, another thing that I've had gripes with other manufacturers is buffers that kind of just parachute out. And it's not just one manufacturer, I've had it from several. So it's nice to see that these are well fitted in there. And when we look inside, actually, the detail in that cab is one of the best detailed uh, diesel cabs that I've seen in a long time. We've got all of the separate picked out detail on the driver's control desk, the separately applied wheel, and actually having cab lights, working cab lights, once we get this DCC fitted to check it out, I can see that actually it's worth having on just to show off the detail in there. I might also, um, oh, I can't, it's a loner. I was going to say, um, it might be nice to see just how easy it is to fit a driver's figure in, but uh, yeah, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. We've also got the exhaust stacks on this end. They're made from a kind of very 
Quite a sturdy but springy plastic. Lamp irons, a factory applied. These windscreen wipers as well are really nicely done. And one of the little things that I've noticed there is the overhead warning flash that's on the windscreen is underneath the windscreen wiper. So there's actually a lot of thought gone into the finish of this to kind of build up those different layers as per the prototype. I'm gonna turn it around now and look at the other end. And one thing I can notice there is there's a bit of a bend on the coupling hook. It's just received a knock. I'm just gonna, there you are. Just try and bend that back into shape. They are hands, you're welcome. Uh, just fix that little issue. It's probably just got caught getting put in the box in the factory. It's no big deal. These coupling hooks are made of metal, so they are actually fairly bendable without any uh, risk of them snapping. And at this end, correctly, we don't have exhaust stacks because it only has that at one end, but we've still got that exquisite cab um, control desk detail in there. And also we've got what appear to be lights at both ends. And I think that's one of the, the five lighting functions that it mentions in the uh, uh, in the paperwork that comes with this. So again, we'll take a good look at that as we uh, get it DCC fitted. Now, um, in terms of the, the bogey design, it appears to be, yes it is, all wheel drive, all wheel pickup, which is as good as you can get from a unit of this length. So it's got eight wheels, it picks up from eight wheels, it drives from eight wheels. So I've got every faith that this will be very sure footed and will be a great runner. We've also got separately applied steps on the bogies. They're all in the right place. And again, they do seem to be pretty robustly on there. So no problems there whatsoever. And the wheels are correctly finished. In fact, they've got a lovely dish to the front face. They're not just generic wheels that we see on a lot of these multiple units and diesels, but they've actually got the correct pattern front faces, it seems, as well, which is a really nice touch. And they've got the white wall around the edges too, which um, really does bring this unit to the fore. Looking in through the windows, the interior, I believe there is a coaching light bar as well in here, which is another one of the lighting functions. And we've got a full interior with these bench seats. And actually, this unit is almost crying out for a full set of seated passengers. And actually, uh, Hornby do do a set of seated passengers relatively cheaply. And they might be an ideal choice to start to fit this out. Other figures are available. Roof detail is, it's subtle, but it's there and it looks good. It looks good from a distance. It looks good close up. The torpedo vents are actually pretty finely detailed, but they are molded on, which is great. Keeps the cost down. And uh, as I said to you before, these are currently on sale on the Hatton's website, starting at £89 for some of the, uh, the things like the rail track route learners, ranging up to £99 for models such as this, Network Southeast, and the regional railways. And then they go up from that to £123 if you want your model DCC fitted straight out of the box. So there's something there for everyone. In terms of actual um, a score here, I'm looking at this and this model is better than I was expecting. And there aren't many models that manage to do that. And looking at this, what I'm left thinking is, actually, I really want this. Um, Hattons have sent it over genuinely as a, as a loaner. They do want this back at the end of this. But you know what? Hattons, save yourself the postage for the return journey. They are going to buy this. And just to prove that I'm buying this, I'm going to show you a copy of the receipt after I've paid for it. So there you go. For running qualities, out of the box, it runs pretty well. On DCC as well, pretty smooth control. And uh, we've got control of all those different lighting functions too. With little dip switches inside if you want to turn them off for DC running. So overall, we've got a 9.9 .9 out of 10 for this. And... Again, it's a generous score, but I'm pleasantly pleased because out of the box, what has really blown me away on this is this um, eye-catching underframe detail, and it really makes this model stand out. It could have been boring with just the plain all-over rail blue, but this underframe detail really edges it for me. This is a lovely model.
So I've got it up here. I'm going to attempt a DCC fitting using one of the Hatton's own 21 pin decoder. Although any 21 pin decoder will be fine. And what the instructions recommend is an MTC compatible one, which will give you the full range of lighting functions. So first things first, on the diagram, we've got the clip points. And this is very much like the class 22 uh, and actually also a lot like Helgen's uh, class 128 as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just try and lever them apart. This is the bit where I'm always a little bit wary. I'm going to use a small jeweler's screwdriver just to wedge in there. This may take a few goes. So what should actually happen is that the, the chassis will drop out from the body. But um, certainly on a new model like this, it can be just a little bit difficult and you want to as well make sure that you don't try and grab it by any of the delicate detail so lift and shake once it drops a little bit it should there I can feel it just give at that end don't do it too far off the ground otherwise you'll end up with the chassis suddenly dropping out and getting broken just let gravity do most of the work. Now you see here we've got a little box that says DCC that just uh, pinch and pull and then we've got the blanking plate. Now the blanking plate on this has a series of switches as outlined in, um, in the paperwork that comes with it. So if you're running it on DC you're going to leave that uh, custom blanking plate in but it's got the means whereby you can change what things are doing but we've got a full MTC compliant DCC chip so this big blanking plate and actually I've never seen any blanking plate quite like this it's quite complex I'm going to very carefully lever this up and out don't lever it from just one side because you'll bend all the pins yeah it's the most complicated blanking plate I have ever seen so I'm going to keep hold of that actually and we've got the chip here. We look for the locating pin, the pin one. It's dead easy to spot. And that corresponds with where you see there's one pin missing on that end. So we want to just very carefully line that up. Make sure that you get the right one on. Once it's aligned, gently but firmly push down until it's all the way home. And then actually, we can put this box back over the top. And there we have it. What I'm going to do now, you see just how quickly that, that is able to be chipped. And DCC chipping doesn't have to be scary. So I'm going to put it on the track. And the first thing I'm going to do is just to make sure that all is well. I'm going to get the program track to read back the address and by default they're always set to number three and you can hear from that buzzing there we go address number three so what I'm actually going to do now whilst I've got an opportunity is program in a running number and as this is my only class 122, I'm going to give it the address number 122, and it's the first class 122 that I've got. And that's just a, a technique that I have. You can put any number you want in to be able to identify this. So I'm going to give it that address. And for now, I'm going to leave all of the other settings as factory defaults. Right, now that we know that that's programmed, we're going to quickly test it and just make sure it runs before I put the lid back on because what you don't want is to go to all that effort of putting the locomotive or the DMU in this case back together only to find that you've got a loose connection or something like that so one two two one and that is actually pretty smooth So our initial test is absolutely fine. So the next step is we want to put the body back on. So 
Again, with these uh, Daypole models, it's actually fairly easy. Just make sure it's lined up, and then if you need to pull the edges apart whilst just put a little tiny bit of, of pressure on the inside just to get it to uh, locate back down. So now we've got it on, clipped in place, and uh, we'll put it back on the track and let's test all these lighting functions. So onto the track, and uh, let's turn the lights on. And you can see there instantly, if you focus on the end, that uh, you can see the direction lights are working quite nicely. So they're changing over and they're on the F0 function, so I can turn them on and off. Let's try some of the other lighting functions. So we've got um, F1, and that turns the cab light on on just this end. And you can see there, that really brings to the fore all of that lovely detail in there. So F0, F1. And then if we look to the other end of it, if I press F2, again, we get cab lights coming on. Turn it off and off, turn it on. Let's see, F3 should do something. We're not getting any interior lights. So we've had the model working on DC and the internal carriage lights worked okay on DC. When we've put the chip in, I followed the instructions, uh, pressed F3, and we just can't seem to get that coach lighting bar to light up at all. We tried some of the other function keys just in case. Uh, it, it seems to be an issue with the chip rather than the locomotive because we had that working on DC. Um, according to the instructions, that suggests that the chip is not MTC compliant. Um, so I've just got to say as I find it, but everything else is working absolutely fine. The motion on this is silky smooth. It is a really smooth running locomotive. The direction control lights are really good, working just fine. And then we've got a choice of um, both ends cab lights. We can control them independently. So a big thumbs up on DC. And also you can also sound fit this locomotive with relative ease. It's got an inbuilt sound chamber, it just needs the speaker fitting. And it does give some recommendation in the paperwork as to what speaker it recommends that you buy. And certainly I've had a lot of success with uh, these uh, first generation DMU units using the Soundtracks uh, budget sound decoder. So that might be an area that you want to explore if you want to fit sound to these but don't want to go the whole hog of a really expensive sound chip. One of the things I have noticed is that the, the adhesion and the pulling power of this, even though it's a single car DMU unit, is pretty impressive. I forgot that I'd left another train on the track and it's actually capable of pushing that locomotive reasonably well. So it just gives you an idea that actually this has tremendous adhesion. It is a great model and the more I'm using it, the more I really like it. So I'm glad I've just bought this. Well, I hope that video was informative to you. And don't forget that you can follow the links down below if uh, this model or indeed any of the other ones in the liveries that they've got on sale are of interest to you. So if you follow those links, you'll be able to get yourself right to where it matters. But until next time, big, big thank you to you. It's been great to have your company. And don't forget to like this video and really importantly, share it too. Let other people know about this video if you think it's of interest to them. And uh, if you're not already done so, subscribe to the channel and you'll be the first to know about new videos as and when they go up. And also don't forget that you can head on over to Patreon and you can support us there and help us to make more of the videos that you love. But until next time, this is me, Jenny Kirk, saying thanks for watching. You take really good care of yourself, and I hope to see you back here next time. Bye for now. Today's video has been brought to you in part thanks to the generous donation of my fans on Patreon. And an extra special huge thanks goes out to Anthony Kidson, Michael Churchwood, Bob Threeton, Alec Ralph, Anthony Hunt, William Wade, Wayne Johns, Offshore Allen, and oorail.co.uk If you'd like to help support the show, head on over to patreon.com slash jenniferkirk. Thank you.
Today's video has been brought to you by my books Bringing Home the Stars, Twinkle Little Star and also you can get the complete comic collections of All Over the House Books 1, Books 2 and also the wacky zany Life of Knobty Mouse. Thanks and catch you later.